Hi there. It's great to see everybody out here. Uh, I'm excited to give, talk to you about Kubernetes this today. Uh, I'm Brendan Burns. I'm a software engineer at Google. Uh, there's going to be a couple other people coming up over the course, and they'll introduce themselves. So you heard a little bit about Kubernetes in the keynote. And so hopefully, if you hadn't heard about it before, you've got a little bit of context. We're going to go a little bit deeper today and try and explain both where we're coming from, why we built it, and what's the new awesomeness that we just built. All right, so I wanted to take a little bit of a, a step back and give you a little bit of the history of where we came from. Uh, Eric went into this a little bit this morning, so we're going to kind of move through it relatively quickly so you don't get bored. Hopefully you saw some of that stuff in the opening keynote today. Um, but in some sense, Google, a long time ago, was exactly like the way a lot of enterprise and a lot of other data centers are now. Um, Every single app had its own machine. You would use you know, ticketing and things like that to find machines. It was hard to manage, hard to scale, painful for people to operate. And so we started to figure out, well, what do we need to do in order to move away from the sort of one app per machine model? Um, and the very beginnings of that were things like CH roots, putting, using NICE, using some of the sort of traditional things that allow you to multi-tenant things. But it wasn't sufficient, right? It, noisy neighbors are a, a significant problem in that world, uh, where you know some intern running a MapReduce can totally obliterate your search infrastructure, and that's just not an acceptable way to run things. And so, moving forward, we started to develop technology that enabled us to have better isolation of these processes, and that eventually led to things like C groups that Google contributed to the Linux kernel. All right. And, and what we found eventually was that actually these isolation boundaries really helped us you know, maximize the utilization of the machines to the point where our utilization of machines is significantly higher than that of, of people basically throughout the rest of the industry. And it's not necessarily because the people who use the machines are smarter about packing things, but it's actually just that we have better isolation and that enables us to pack things for them. And that's really what Kubernetes is trying to do as well. All right. So then eventually Docker came around and took a lot of these technologies and packaged them up in a really amazing way. And Eric said that you know, it's the container image that Docker came around with and the building tools around that that really sort of opened up the world of containers and some of the value of containers on the node to the broader world. And suddenly we saw this explosion of interest in containers. Um, it was really gratifying, I think, for a lot of us because suddenly we, all of the stuff that we had been talking about and thinking about internally we could share with the outside world. Um, and so the time was right, about a little under two years ago, the time was right to start sharing some of the experiences we'd had over the preceding you know, eight years, and to start listening as well, right? We were starting to build out the cloud platform, and we knew that our own internal experience wasn't necessarily the same as where our users were coming from. And so we wanted to go forth with this project and share what we knew, but also accept and build a community around where people were. And that led to the development of Kubernetes. Kubernetes. It's an open source container management system. Again, you, you heard about it this morning from Eric, so I don't want to belabor the point. Um, but it supports, and you actually hopefully saw the demo as well in the keynote yesterday, it supports multiple cloud environments. It supports on-prem physical machines. It supports the Raspberry Pi cluster that I have you know, in my closet. Um, and it's 100% open source. It's written in Go. Uh, if you haven't checked out Go, it's a pretty fun language. So that by itself is worth checking out. Um, and it's all available out on GitHub. All right. The core principles of Kubernetes, I think this is really important. We, when we were going into it, we really wanted to talk about what we were trying to accomplish when we built Kubernetes. And part of what we were trying to accomplish is that we knew that people were going to be using, unlike in Google where everything is built from source, people are going to take off-the-shelf software. They're going to take MySQL. They're going to take Nginx. They're going to put them in containers and run them. And, and rewriting those applications just isn't an option for users. Um, and then. The other important principle that sort of runs throughout Kubernetes is that coupling is really, really bad. When you take systems and you package them together tightly and so they're tightly coupled, you end up making changes in one place that break things in another place that you weren't anticipating. And that leads to instability. It leads to an inability to move your software forward. All of the things that are necessary to build a scalable, agile uh, platform 
they go away if you couple your software really tightly together. So we really wanted to decouple our software. Um, and then there's a lot about making sure that we are open, making sure that we, you know, we really saw that this open infrastructure movement was happening. It was something that was important to participate in. You're even starting to see this on the hardware side, on the data center design side, with, you know, Facebook and others participating in, in open data center designs. Um, it's just, that's the way that the data centers of the future are going to be built, and we want it to be part of that. Um, and then also, we really wanted to, I, I, what I like to say, I don't, I don't know if people have had a chance to take a look at the Kubernetes paper that we published recently, but one of the key insights there is that Kubernetes and container cluster orchestration systems really allow you to change the primary key of your data center from being the machine to being the application, right? We want people to start really forgetting about machines and thinking about applications instead. Um, and so all of this sort of says we have experienced a lot of the things that are, that are bothering people right now out there in software development, and we've built some solutions that we really believe help you move on. And this is an image that I use in a lot of my talks, and I think it really captures, in some sense, what we're trying to accomplish. The challenge of driving something like this semi-truck that, fa that, that uh, crashed in the middle here is the semi-truck is a coupled system, right? There is the cab that is pulling it and the trailer, and as anybody who's backed up a trailer knows, you could be backing up in one direction and your trailer can be going in completely the opposite direction, right? That coupling, that unintended consequence of some action, because rarely do you take actions that you think are gonna fail, right? Rarely do you like push a config because you know that it's bad and it's gonna cause your application to go down. Um, but what you don't, what, the reason you, you, know, you have all of those failures related to human error is that there's an unanticipated consequence, and that unanticipated consequence almost always comes from this kind of coupling. All right, and to illustrate this a little bit more, when you think about things in a machine-oriented way, when your data center is machine-oriented, and you think about physical infrastructure, you end up with things like this, right, where your services are splattered across three different machines, and when you think about the machine, you think, oh, okay, you know, I really need to upgrade libc on machine number one, because, you know, my back end needs this new version of libc. And so you go in and you upgrade, you know, libc on, that, on machine one, and your back end is like, I'm awesome, I'm happy to go. And then it turns out your front end's all crashed. Because they use that library too, but they used a slightly different version of that library, and there's a bug in the library that you just upgraded that caused them to start crashing. That's the unintended consequence, right? That's why coupling, in, in this world is bad. And so what we would really like to do is show you how Kubernetes enables you to create what we call logical infrastructure. And logical infrastructure basically says forget about the machines, right? The machines disappear below the Kubernetes API, below this unified substrate, and you start thinking about your applications. It's an application-oriented infrastructure. All of your front ends are the same. The thing that you're going to change is your front end. The thing that you're going to upgrade is your front end. And in this way, you've decoupled all of these systems from one another, and you don't have those unintended consequences that cause stability problems. All right. Another really important part of being open and being transparent is this idea of workload portability, right? There's all sorts of reasons for people to be in multiple kinds of data centers, be it their own on-prem data centers, private cloud, public cloud, co-location, whatever it happens to be. There's a lot of reasons why you're gonna be in a lot of different places, and we profoundly believe that the future of cloud is hybrid, right? And so in that world, it's important to have a system that spans these things, right? It enables you to move your application from vendor to vendor if they're having stability problems, if they're having pricing that you don't like, if a different vendor comes along and has better pricing, whatever the motivation happens to be, not being locked into a particular vendor by using their APIs is really powerful for you as an end user. And Kubernetes, with its open source aspect and its ability to run anywhere, means if you write applications to the Kubernetes APIs, those APIs are available and can move with you wherever you choose to go, or indeed can normalize your environment as well. And so this comes down to the sort of idea of write once, run anywhere, which, you know, by now kind of has sort of a bad reputation, I guess, at some level, because, of course, there's the asterisks, right? It's, it's the, this is mostly true, this isn't 100% true, but really, if you build in a container which encapsulates all of its dependencies into this hermetically sealed box, and you deploy and you use services provided by the Kubernetes API, you really are targeting a, a runtime that is pretty independent of the infrastructure that it's running on top of, right? In the same way that if you write a program in a higher level language, 
usually, and that's where the asterisk comes in, of course, that program can run on a variety of architectures from, you know, ARM in the Raspberry Pi to x86 to, you know, MIPS on a router or whatever it happens to be. Um, and some examples of this inside the Kubernetes API where we've really tried to put in some effort into making these things portable include things like our networking model where we really tried to be agnostic. We didn't just sort of say like, oh, hey, this works great on GCE. Nobody else can do it anywhere else. Ingress is another really great example of this where we created an API object for doing HTTP load balancing and actually the implementation of how that actually produces a balancer is developed outside of the Kubernetes core code base. So if you want one for your favorite cloud provider, you want one for your physical, you know, uh, hardware load balancer, you can build all of these things. And there's one API object, but the implementation can be in a variety of different ways. Um, our services exam are examples of this as well, as well as persistent volumes where I think at this point we support 12 different volume types, different distributed storage technologies, different cloud storage technologies, really enables you to be isolated from the specifics of the platform that you're running on. Um, and then finally, I, I talked a lot about this coupling. We really think that the Kubernetes API allows you to build these systems that are decoupled from each other, right? So that you can actually have different teams doing rollouts at different layers, your front end team, can roll out a new set of the front ends without ever communicating with the middleware or the back end teams at all, right? Or the middleware team can do a rollout and never communicate with the front end team or the back end team. That's hugely important for distributed teams, for scaling teams up, and all of these things are made available by, you know, the ability to isolate things behind, you know, a service IP that is unchanging. Right? It doesn't matter that the actual pods that implemented a particular service have come up or gone down. The front end still just talks to the same service IP. Um, likewise, we also want you to be decoupled from Kubernetes itself. We want to provide tools so that, you know, if you have a configuration that looks for a particular environment variable, you don't have to teach Nginx that it's running inside of Kubernetes. You can use things like the downward API to project parts of the Kubernetes API into environment variables that Nginx already knows how to consume, right? This is part of meeting people where they are, as well as ensuring that that application that somebody wrote isn't a Kubernetes version of the application. It's the same application, whether it's running inside of Kubernetes or any other kind of environment. Um, and then the other part of this is you can do this kind of lift and shift, right? Like maybe you're not hybrid, but you don't want to be stuck, right? You can, if you get to a place where the platform doesn't work, if you're in GKE and you, you reach that place where you're like, no, we really need to be on-prem for some reason, you know, we'll be sad, of course, but you can do that, right? You can take your workload out of GKE, roll it on over to, uh, you know, the, uh, an on-prem cluster. Or likewise, if you're in a different public cloud provider right now, right, we understand lots of people, use different public clouds. You can start with Kubernetes in that environment and build a place where, you know, as, as we demonstrate to you the value of running inside the Google Cloud Platform, you'll be able to easily move that application across. Or you can gradually move your application from one platform to another. And that's also a, a key component of being open and being hybrid. All right. So that was sort of the prehistory. Hopefully it wasn't too redundant with the things that happened in the keynote. I'd like to take a step forward to now to what's, what's next, what's going on uh, here. So one thing I really like to highlight here is the velocity, and Eric sort of mentioned this with the high level, 27,000 commits, but this graph I think really speaks to it in a more dramatic fashion. You know, we're doing 46 commits a day, and that's averaged across the weekend, and so, and we don't actually do that many commits on the weekends because we all have lives. Um, and so the velocity with which we are doing this is just amazing. And as well, at the same time, we're seeing new people come into the community. That's fantastic as well. Um, really excited to see that. Really excited to see all of the companies that are contributing, not just using, but contributing as well. Um, we really want to build a community that isn't just a bunch of Googlers throwing code over the wall, but is really a holistic community. As part of that, you may have also seen the announcement that uh, we've contributed Kubernetes to the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, so the intellectual property around Kubernetes is now actually out and available and available to the Linux Foundation. And as part of that, I want to introduce Rich Steenberg, who's a principal engineer at WePay, who's going to talk a little bit about how they use Kubernetes um, to power WePay. So, Rich, thanks. Thanks, Brendan.
Hi, I'm Rich. And I'm here to talk about WePay uh, and our, our experiences with Kubernetes. So WePay, I know it's going to find it hard to believe, but we're about payments. We do payments. <laughs> we are uh, a startup down in Redwood City. And what we do is we uh, do payments between individuals. We allow our partners to build the relationship between the individuals, and then we take over the payment from there. And as part of that, we hold credit card data, and we're PCI certified. And we do this using a PHP monolith application that has been kind of changing with different business models. And now that we're taken off like crazy, this PHP monolith needs to be taken apart. It needs to be broken into smaller services, and, and we need a way to deploy these services. So we took, let me move forward. So we took three swings at this bat or at this ball. The first was uh, we had some bad SQL that was running against our, our database, and we needed to move that off. So we, we knew we wanted to do Docker, and we put this load into a Docker container, and we started it manually, and we had it going. Um, and it wasn't great, but it, it really helped. Um, the second was Ansible and deploying to individual machines, and we didn't really know how to do topology at that point, so it was really one VM per, I'm sorry, one Docker container per VM. And, and that was it. And we were in Google Cloud, and Kubernetes, we were part of the community, we were part of the beta program, we had developers inside WePay that are really excited about Kubernetes, and, and as soon as it became GA in uh, July of 2015, we were on board. And it really dramatically changed our whole business because now we're able to spread our workload across multiple machines. It solved canary deploys. It solved being able to do rolling deployments. It really just sort of changed us, and it's been great. And one of the things that I want to underscore about Kubernetes is that it's changing rapidly. The, the problems and things that we're dealing with, we can look in a roadmap and actually see features that are going to help us. But more than that, it actually is real use cases that we have problems with. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've done uh, uh, with Kubernetes that have been sort of outside of what Kubernetes can do, and then, then we'll go from there. So because we're PCI certified, and we talked, the, the keynote talked a little bit about this, but uh, about not having a GUI center, everything that communicates back and forth must be encrypted. And that's just from the early stages of Kubernetes wasn't available. So what we did is, uh, um, built a sidecar in the pod with Nginx in it. And kubeDNS gives you uh, a, a domain name. It's like a private domain. And we built our own in-house CA that uh, served that CN as the domain name. And that's how we terminate SSL. Another example is uh, since we're PCI certified, when the PCI auditors come in, they want to look at the smallest number of machines possible. They do not want to look at hundreds and hundreds of VMs. They want to be basically down to the smallest set possible. And in, piece, in uh, Kubernetes terms, what that means, uh, a dedicated cluster for PCI. And with a dedicated cluster for PCI, we then need two dedicated clusters because uh, we need high availability across zones. And so they need a four uh, dedicated clusters. And, and these clusters need to communicate with one another. So there, there's a need for some sort of inter-cluster service discovery. And what we're doing now is we're just hard coding those service endpoints. But we're looking forward to Kubernetes, and we've also looked at Buoyant. But Kubernetes is really cool and being able to, to solve this problem. Um, lastly is secrets. And there's a lot of talk about secrets today. They talked about it in the keynote. And it's a, it's a, it's a big thing that you got to consider. Um, so the way we're taking care of it at this point is using HashiCorp Vault. And that's just uh, encryption as a service. And there's authenticated API calls that are scoped to the application. So the really good thing about this is that it's not putting secrets unencrypted anywhere on disk. It's memory to memory communication, and it's basically leased out. Um, so that's been sort of some use cases. And uh, uh, I want to say again that Kubernetes doesn't really put you into a box. You can really kind of do what you want with it and take what they've given us and, and build on top of it. And at the same time, it's constantly changing. The, these problems are being solved by the Kubernetes team, and I'm going to hand it over to Tim right now to tell you about that. Thanks, Rich. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim. I'm one of the software engineers working on Kubernetes. So this is next. So let's talk about what's next. 
So I'm going to talk about a few features that we're pushing out in our Kubernetes 1.2 release, which was launched last week. Uh, and I want to talk in some depth, and I'm going to do some live demos, and we'll, we'll tempt the fates and see what happens. So the first thing that people experience when they have these distributed applications, they need to figure out, how am I going to update this thing? This has been a, a topic at a couple of the talks. I know Eric mentioned it this morning. It was part of the uh, demo yesterday at the keynote. We're improving on what we've done. So the goal here, run an application, update it with zero downtime, zero visibility to your end users. We built our rolling update process completely on our core primitives of Kubernetes. There's nothing magic. There's no backdoor APIs. If you don't like the rolling update that we've built, you can build your own. This comes from a direct lesson from Borg where the update system was really built and tightly coupled into our system. And it turns out, updating different kinds of applications, there's different kinds of requirements. So in uh, version 1 and version 1.0 uh, and 1.1 of Kubernetes, we had this built into our cube control or cube cuddle uh, command line. In version 1.2, we have a new object in our API called a deployment. And a deployment is updates as a service. You tell the deployment, I want you to update from version X to version Y, and you take your hands off, and the deployment object will do it. It's all done server side. You give it a bunch of parameters that tells you how fast you want to go and what happens if there's a failure, and you let it run. If you add this with graceful termination of pods, what you end up with is a clean draining update from your system. Any open connections, users will finish their session, and that se that the old pod will go away, and the new one will come up. I want to walk through a little bit of the update. So imagine for a moment you've got your service, your wonderful My App, right? And backing my application, I've got a replication controller, which has three pod instances that are running it. This is the blue version of the application. If you notice here, you'll see uh, replicas three, and the selector is My App version one, right? So the first thing you're going to do in part of an update is you're going to bring up a new replication controller. Note specifically, this is My App version two. Now, this new replication controller, you're going to take it from zero replicas to one. And now you've got a new replica running. The service, if you notice the selector on the service, is app my app. It's version independent. So at this point, 25% of my users are going to be experiencing my new application. This gives me a really good signal if I can watch my monitoring that, you know, maybe my application is bad and I want to roll it back. But let's assume that you got it right because you guys are all smart people. So you bring up a new one and you bring down an old one. And you bring up, a new, bring up a new one and you bring down an old one. And you repeat this process until the old version of the replication controller has zero replicas left. And then you can just throw it away. Like I said, this is all done server side now in the deployment object, which you're going to get for free if you run kubectl run. Uh, it's uh, new, new in the version 1.2 API. The next thing people tend to run into is scaling. I need my application to be responsive. What happens if, uh, if, if famous celebrity dies, I need to be able to respond with my application in this change in load? So in Kubernetes 1.2, we have launched uh, something we call a horizontal pod autoscaler. That's a mouthful. But what it does is it takes metrics. Currently, we do CPU utilization or custom metrics, which are alpha, but they, they work. Uh, you take these metrics and you feed it into the replication system, and the replication can say, hey, you've crossed a threshold, let me scale you up. Or, hey, you've dropped below a threshold, let me scale you down. Obviously, you give it some min-max bounds, and it operates within those bounds, but again, you set it and you forget it. This frees you from having to worry about what happens if something happens in a different time zone and you're not at a console and you don't, aren't there to provision new machines. This is the ethos of Kubernetes. You don't have to worry about it. Next thing that people tend to run into, persistent storage, right? We like to talk about treating your, stores, your, your servers like cattle, right? Everybody knows this analogy. Uh, don't worry about them. They're fungible. If they go away, it's not a big deal. But the reality is, somewhere at the bottom of your stack, you've got a database, right? You've got files. You've got storage that you need to run your stuff. So we have an abstraction called persistent volumes in Kubernetes, which lets you create durable storage in your network or on NFS or uh, in a, you know, any one of uh, a, a almost two dozen, uh, correct Brendan, it's not 12, it's actually closer to 20 uh, different volume types. Um, you store your data there, and then as a user, you can claim that data, and that data is yours. So uh, new in Kubernetes 1.2, we have auto-provisioning. If you ask for data and there's nothing in the system that can satisfy that request, we'll go off and we'll make it for you. 
assuming you're in a cloud provider that supports it, like GCE or Amazon or uh, OpenStack, we can automatically go out and make this new volume for you. What's really cool now is you can write all your data to this persistent volume, and then you can kill your application. Tear it down, you know what, my, my SQL service is done, but I need to offload all that data into my monitoring system. You can then hand off that data to a different pod because you still own that data. Uh, it exists until you're done with it. We never destroy it until you tell us that it's okay. This is an application-oriented use of infrastructure. Don't think about the disks, don't think about the iSCSIs, don't think about where they actually are. Think about what you want to do with it. So let's do a live demo. If we can switch to the demo, guys. So I have to apologize, first of all, I cannot type and talk at the same time. So I have this self-typing demo, but I promise you it is running live against my GCE cluster right now. So here we go. So this script, uh, first thing I'm going to show you, there are no claims. PVC is a persistent volume claim. It's a shortcut. Uh, I'm showing you with our cube control command, there are no claims in our system. So let's go off and create a claim. To do this, we're going to look at this little blob of YAML. You can see here the claim is called uh, um, PV provisioning demo. It's existing in the demo's namespace. Uh, what I'm asking for is something that is read-write accessible, and I want 10 gigabytes of space. And so just like that, it's been created. And we're going to take a look at what we've done with the describe command. And it shows you here that we have uh, a, 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 per, a persistent volume claim that is already in the bound state. What that means is it's already gone off and created a volume for us and bound it to this claim, and it has satisfied it with 10 gigabytes. So this loop is actually going to do nothing because it happened so quickly. So here you can see the short form. Uh, it happened 33 seconds ago. That's my proof that it's real. So here I ran gcloud compute disks list, which shows me in the Google Compute Engine, here's the list of disks I grepped for the ones that I know that it's going to match, and it's going to match this dynamic disk. So now I'm going to go use this. Again, here's a little blob of YAML that shows me a pod. The important part here is what the pod does. It does an sh-c, which says go run this shell command. It's going to touch a file called slash pv slash whatever my current host name is. We set the host name to the pod name, so you can see that this file gets created on the pod, and then it's just going to go to sleep. And just like that, my pod is created, and it's probably already running before I can finish typing it out. So you can see it's scheduled. It's been assigned to minion IA9N. And we'll wait for it to give us a running status so that we can actually go poke at it. OK, it is running. So I'm going to use cube control and exec into this to give me a shell. So I'm now live into this running container. If I ls in the slash pv directory, you see that this file is demo blah, blah, blah. That is it. So I'm going to say, so I've now created this file. So I'm going to exit the shell. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete that pod. Now this pod is gone from the system. That running process is gone. just to prove it, but my claim still exists. I still own this data, and it is still there, and it is still bound. And in Compute Engine, maybe, oh, there we go, it still exists. So now I'm going to run another pod, right? My MySQL finished. I want to go run the uh, post-processing. I want to I analyze my user logs or, or something that I want to do here. So I've gone and created another pod. And it's going to check that it's running. And I'm going to shell into this one again. And what you're going to see, cross your fingers, is that those files that we wrote before still exist. 
So there you can see now I've got two host, uh, two files that are specific to the host name and the hello file that I wrote before. Now I can do this any number of times. I can keep handing off the pod from container to container, or the, the volume from container to container until I'm done with it. So let me exit this and say I'm done with it. So I'm gonna go delete my pod. You can see again that the pod is gone. This is all happening real. This is how fast the system actually operates. I've deleted my claim, and my claim is gone. And the persistent volume that was backing that claim is also gone. And if I were to look at gcloud, which I don't think I did, if I were to look at gcloud one more time, it would show me that that persistent volume has been erased. What this means for you is you are free to work on your application and not worry about who's managing the infrastructure, not send a ticket to provision a new volume. Can you switch back to the slides, please? Demo number one. It worked. I'm going to tempt the fates and do it twice. So, new also in Kubernetes 1.2, multi-zone clusters. You guys, you were asked, and we heard, and we answered. So, you can now bring up a cluster that spans multiple zones, GKEs, or GCE zones, or multiple Amazon availability zones. We'll label those, the, the nodes that come up on those zones, and when you schedule a work, we're going to spread them across those zones. Now, if a zone blows up, you're safe. Your application's not going to go down. Kubernetes will say, oh, damn, what happened to those copies? And it will bring up new ones on these other nodes. This is what it's all about. 2 a.m., Sunday night, you're sleeping. Do you want your pager to go off because Google brought a zone down? Heck no. Just handle it for me, right? Send me an email. In the morning, I'll take a look. This is what it's about. So there's zero changes to the Kubernetes API. You don't need to know about zones. All you need to know is that when you provision this cluster, you brought it up in multiple zones. Um, this is GA in version 1.2. Uh, the code name for this project has been called Ubernetes, uh, and Ubernetes is going to continue to evolve. We're going to build out a more federated cluster model in upcoming versions of our system. This is what we called Ubernetes Lite. So the next thing that people talk about, and Brendan mentioned this, Ingress, L7 load balancing. We built the core of Kubernetes uh, around the idea of L3 and L4 load balancing because we wanted to be really agnostic to applications. It turns out, unsurprisingly, a lot of you are building HTTP-based applications, and you want a way to get HTTP into your, into your clusters. So again, you asked and we listened. We built a new API object called Ingress. Ingress will allow you to describe a map based on host headers or based on URL paths that will take incoming HTTP traffic and route it to various Kubernetes service backends. So now, again, you can build out your microservices. You can have your um, contact manager as one application, and you can have your email box as another application, and they can come in through the same uh, URL and be spread out into these different services. This is literally how Google operates. Uh, we have implementations of the, Eng of the uh, Ingress API against GCE. Uh, there's one against Amazon that's being developed right now, HAProxy and Nginx. What this really means is if you want to run on-premise, you can totally do it. You can run HAProxy on your premise, you can pick up your application, you can move it to GCE, and you can get all the awesome power of the GCE load balancer API, if you saw that talk yesterday. The, the reality of these cloud provider APIs is sometimes they're complicated, and if you learn the GCE load balancer API, and then you want to move to Amazon, then you have to learn the Amazon load balancer API. And these two things can't be any more different. And you don't, you don't want to deal with that. That's, that's a mess. That's coupling. So Ingress gives you a way to uncouple from that. The next thing people talk about, and Rich mentioned this with respect to, to uh, his, his stuff at WePay, is secrets. You've got to authenticate your applications. You've got to give them access to a secured something. I don't care what it is. Maybe it's an SSH key. Maybe it's an API token. Maybe it's a password in plain text in a file. You have access, or you have a need to access these things. But we've all read the 12-factor uh, manifesto, right? 12-factor says you put your configuration in the environment, right? Well, Kubernetes is the environment. This is where you're getting stuff. So we are now giving you an API to manage your secrets through our unified Kubernetes API, through the same cube control command line interface, through the same YAML objects with the same semantics as everything else. You inject them into your application late bound. You, you, know, you write it in your API, you run your application, you join these two things at the very last second. 
They are written in a tempfs, so you never write to the disk. They're only in memory. And you can then access them as files or environment variables from your application. So let's do a live demo. Can we switch to the demo slide or demo screen? Thank you. All right. So, like everything else, there's a little bit of YAML behind it. I'm going to go off and create a secret. It is called my secret password. Uh, it is a type opaque. It's not an, uh, a TLS certificate or anything that we might know about. Uh, the username and the password are base64 here, simply so we can stick binary data into this YAML file. Like everything else, we just run cube control create dash f. It goes off and creates my secret. Now I'm going to go off and create a pod. Again, all this pod does is go to sleep, um, but it mounts this secret. You see the volume secret here? Uh, it's going to mount it at the slash data directory. So I'll just create the pod. And the pod is there and it's running. And again, I'm going to shell into this just to show you what we've got. So if I look in slash data now, I've got this virtual directory that is password and username. So I can cat slash data. And you can see that it's me. And I can show you my password. And when I log out of that pod, that's it. My pod's now running. If that was an SSH key, I could then use that credentials to get into uh, my SSH uh, the, the other peers, or I could use it as an API token to go into Twilio or whatever I needed it to be. You can switch back to the main slides now. Demo number two. So I've only got a few minutes left, but I wanted to talk about some of the things we've done and are doing around performance and scalability of Kubernetes. Um, we started 1.0. And we said Kubernetes runs on 100 nodes. And 100 is a kind of underwhelming number, right? People said, Google, what are you doing? 100 nodes? And the truth is, I'm going to look out in this audience. I'm not going to do a survey. But how many of you, think in your head, how many of you have more than 100 serving nodes right now, right? And uh, I don't need to see hands. Um, it's not that many people. But we heard people said, actually, there are a lot of, there are enough people out there that need more than 100 that we decided we were going to ramp it up. So the first thing we did is we defined an SLO, a service level objective. We said, we're not going to ramp it up unless we can do it fast, right? So we set our objective. 99% of all of our API calls return in less than one second, and 99% of pods start up in less than five seconds. And that has to be true on a fully loaded cluster, the first pod and the last pod. And then we use that to test how high we can go. In Kubernetes 1.2, I'm happy to say we're doing more than 1,000 nodes at more than 30,000 pods in a given cluster with our API server meeting this SLO. Now, if you don't mind about the SLO, you can probably double or even triple those numbers, uh, and you know, things will get a little bit slower. But this is, this is where we are with 1.2, 1,000 nodes. Now, all those people who thought, yeah, I have more than 100 nodes, do you have more than 1,000 nodes? I bet there's a very, very small number of you out there, right? Which is fine. When you need it, when your startup hits it gold, we're there for you. Other things we've done in the 1.2 release, we revamped our cube proxy system, which is the backbone of our virtual IP services model. Uh, in the 1.0 and 1.1 release, it did a user space copy, which we knew was a little bit slow and was going to be limiting to scalability. In 1.2, it never moves to user space. It's purely done in kernel. Man, is it fast. For the demo that we did for the, the keynote, uh, we were getting ready to get set up, and we were realizing that the load testers were causing problems. And the first thing that we did was we switched to the IP tables proxy, and all the problems were gone. So uh, if I didn't believe it before, that's it. Um, additionally, in 1.2, massive reduction in the usage of CPU and memory that our own components use on the system. This 4x number comes from the guys at Red Hat. So don't take my word for it. Um, this means there's more memory and CPU left for you to run your applications, right? We want to be as slim as we possibly can be for you. Now, this, of course, isn't good enough. So what's next? 
1.3, we're planning to massively increase the scale again. I don't want to talk numbers just yet, but it'll be big. Uh, we're talking about moving to a binary encoded protocol. JSON, it turns out, kind of slow. Uh, when we ran a profile against our system, the number one hit was JSON Marshall and Unmarshall. So we're going to move to a binary encoded protocol. You'd still be JSON there if you want it, but we're going to use our uh, component to component stuff. We'll all be done through Protobuf and gRPC. Um, we also are adding a bunch of caching and parallelization in our scheduler, so our scheduler throughput will be massively faster, uh, will be massively more scalable. You can see here our graph uh, from our current performance metrics. We're publishing a blog post on this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but it'll be soon, and you'll be able to read a lot more about what we've done with performance and scalability on Kubernetes 1.2. All of this is available right now. Kubernetes 1.2 is in the middle of rolling out to GKE right now. In fact, it might be done this very day. If you want it, you can go to your container engine, you can run the upgrade command, and you can get all this goodness right here, right now. So all that said, we have a ton of work to do. We have 800 man years of work on our roadmap. I'm not even kidding. Uh, and that's if we only do the things we know about. Kubernetes is an open project. We built it from the very beginning to be open source, open ideas, open standards, open community. We do everything in the public. If anybody here has clicked that uh, watch icon in GitHub on the Kubernetes repo, I feel bad for you because there is so much going on. Uh, it's exciting. I'm, I'm passionate and excited about this. We need your help. We need people who are using this thing to come in and tell us what works, what doesn't work, what do you need out of the system, because we are listening. We want to make it work for you guys. So you can see here, we've got our URL. The code, of course, is on GitHub. All of us hang out on Slack all the time. Come and ask us questions. We have dedicated people who sit there and answer user support questions all day. Uh, we're also on Stack Overflow, and we're on Twitter. You can find Brendan and myself and many other people there and come and ask us questions. So I understand we are not doing a Q&A session now, but at the end of these sessions, we will all be hanging out in the playground. Uh, we'll grab a quick bite to eat, and we'll be out there to do Q&A, talk to people, come tell us your story, tell us what worked, what didn't work. I want to hear from you. So thank you all very much.